Yes, good, good. Oh, well, it's 11 o'clock and I think we've got quite a few people joining us today from around the country, which is really great. So I was just going to give people a minute or two to log on in case there's any difficulties. And um, first of all, I can see everyone's name nice and clearly here, but I was going to ask if people could type in their community group, if they're from a community group. And I'm sure you all know how to do that, which is hovering over your face and typing into the three little white dots in the top right hand corner. <clears throat> and um, first of all, I'm just going to say welcome, welcome everybody. It's so nice to see everyone. It's really great. And I'm Cathy Ryan and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at the Low Carbon Hub in Oxford and I'm just going to introduce three of my colleagues. We've got Saskia Huggins, who's the Social Impact Director of the Low Carbon Hub, Zoe Tune, who's the Marketing Coordinator, and Tabitha Whiting, who's our Marketing Manager. So, so between the three of us, we usually manage to take care of any tech difficulties but you never really know so um, I just want to say welcome to everyone else who's who's come from around the UK and at the low carbon hub um, we're based in Oxford and we have um, 32 community energy groups that are dotted around the, ca the county who we work with on a regular basis and um, we're sort of, um, this, this is part of Community Energy Fortnight, which is running this week and next week, um, which is um, an initiative from Community Energy England. So this is the second of our local um, um, low carbon hub community Zoom meetings. Um, we held one about three weeks ago, which was really successful. And our community groups asked if we could have them regularly. So, so that's what we're going to do. And so we're having them really once a month. And, and this one is a special one to be part of, of Community Energy England. Um, there's just a few basic things, which is we're going to, um, if you could, um, Put your names also and your group into the chat and then you can also um, ask any questions through there as well um, and we're going to ask you know it's been a really difficult and unusual period that we've been in for the last three months now and it's been a time of real lasting tragedy for many people and I think all of us have been touched by that. All of us either know somebody or, or are personally touched by that ourselves. But out of running alongside all of that has been this incredible uh, creative movement and burst of energy that's galvanised people into helping each other generosity and coming up with amazing initiatives to to help each other and try try and get through this period and so i i'm really um thrilled to say that um we're going to hear from five um, people from different low carbon community energy groups around the county on initiatives and ways that they've managed to keep communication open in their groups and also new initiatives that, that have come up as a result of uh, the coronavirus. So it's 11.04. So I thought, um, I'm just going to say that after, after we've heard from the five groups, we'll take a couple of questions uh, in between each person. And then after that, we're going to split into breakout rooms so that we can have um, a sort of smaller level in more in-depth discussion and then I'm going to ask people to as soon as you get into a breakout group to appoint a person um, who, who would be able to do the feeding back um, and then we're going to ask a question which is, is going to be how can we use what we've learned during lockdown to, to change the future for the better within the context of climate change so that's what that's what we'll be finishing up with at the end so I thought we'd move straight on and hear from Alison Hill, who's chair of Low Carbon Oxford North and also Cyclox, and um, on their fantastic Bikes for Key Workers scheme, which I'm going to leave Alison to tell you just how successful that's been uh, and what a fantastic impact it's had. Thank you, Patrick. Can I, I'll share my screen. Yeah, I hope I can. And while Alison's doing that, just a reminder that we are recording today's yeah, session. Yeah. So if you um, don't want to be featured, please turn off your video and be aware that the chat will also be recorded.
Can everybody see that? Except it's at halfway through. Hold on. Can everybody see that? Yes, I can see it. Oh, great, thank you. So this scheme set up um, early on in lockdown when we became aware of other schemes across the country which were helping provide bikes for key workers when they were unable to take public transport and Cyclox set up this project with Cyclox being the cycle campaign for Oxford um, set up this uh, partnership with Active Oxfordshire and uh, the bike workshop called Broken Spoke um, Co-op and the City Council and the two hospital trusts to um, to start a scheme for uh, refurbishing bikes for key workers in Oxford City and Oxfordshire. Um, and how, how the scheme works is that we've, and I think it's a, a slightly unusual compared with other schemes, is that we have uh, sought donations of bikes from members of the public. Um, we've uh, given those bikes to volunteer mechanics to um, refurbish. Um, and then they've been refurbished and had a safety check off from a qualified mechanic just to make sure that they are safe. Um, and then it's allocated to a key worker. So um, the project has been now going for two months. I'm just go uh, going to the next slide. Um, uh, it really has been <laughs> amazing what's happened. We had uh, 200 sign-ups within two weeks and, and another 200 people are on the secondary waiting list. So we've already had 120 bikes delivered to key workers and uh, we've got 18 amazing mechanics working on the project, um, all communicating with each other, sharing spare bike parts. Um, it's an amazing little community that's been set up of uh, volunteer mechanics. And we've raised so far 7,000 pounds. And can I just acknowledge the low carbon hub here who put in a thousand pounds right early on, which has been wonderful. And, um, we now have, I can't see the last slide because there's pictures over it. Um, yes, and we do, we're doing regular surveys now of the, of the recipients to see how they are changing their cycling behaviour as a result of um, uh, getting receiving a bike. So, um, uh, sorry, moving on. Um, here's the picture of the, our Lord Lieutenant, who was one of our wonderful donors. Um, with the hundredth bike being given out and, and of, um, one of our volunteer mechanics on the left. So just to say we've made a bit of publicity out of that because it just seemed such an opportunity. Um, and some amazing quotes as well from people. We, we've just had so much gratitude. It's just so heartwarming to see what people have um, said in, in, in getting their bikes. And, and they, they grow and grow these quotes. I'll just leave those there for you. I won't read them out and um, and then in terms of impact um, the first results we've had 42 people responding to the initial survey 60 percent of participants can uh, who previously said they were active and that's gone up to 85 uh, percent 60 percent of recipients are using the bike specifically for commuting or essential trips and this is the lovely one, 52% of recipients had either not cycled since childhood or had cycled on and off since childhood. So really getting, we've got people onto bikes who hadn't been naturally thinking about doing it. So uh, I think it, it's been very exciting to see that and witness that. And I personally met quite a few of them because my husband is a mechanic and has done 30 bikes, has actually refurbished 30 bikes. So we've been having quite a few of these people coming to our house, which is su such a privilege. And finally, um, it's not moving, um, here we go. We're just looking for more of everything because, uh, and, and I know this is a, a national um, uh, Zoom call, but within Oxford, we are still going strong, money's still coming in. And we are um, looking for more bike mechanics, more bikes, more key workers. And, and so uh, the scheme we expect will carry on. And we are now building a legacy. We're, we're trying to build up a legacy so that we can 
see how this pla this program can move on beyond where we are now. So I think that's me finished. Thank you, Kathy and everybody. Oh, thank you. I just clicked. Ah, there we go. Yes. Thank you so much, Alison. I mean, I think that's an absolutely inspirational story. And, and I'm really glad that you mentioned legacy there too, because I think, you know, at a sort of transitional moment that we're in at the moment, it could be something that carries on and has a, a life way beyond this yeah, um, that's what really in, hoping. in cycling. So I think that's wonderful. Are there, does anyone have any? Yes. Uh, we have a question. We have a question for Alison. Um, do you have any key pieces of advice for others around the country who might be interested in setting up something similar? Well, um, I, my advice is just get, get a number of people together to really uh, to create a partnership because I, I think Cyclops couldn't have led this by itself partly because we aren't currently an organization where a non you were, where we, we are non associated we're not even a charity they're applying to be a charity and will be become one imminently so uh, active Oxfordshire has been an amazing um, supporting organization and I would say build a partnership first uh, there are lots of people out there who would want to contribute both money and bikes and um, if you work through some of the cycle groups uh, like uh, um, uh, uh, cycle uh, what you know, the um, the road groups like um, we've got in Oxford the condors you'll find mechanics and you'll find a lot of support through those people because there are a lot of people who have the expertise so so I think it's just building a bit of momentum to get people working together and find somebody who's prepared to take the responsibility as well because the active Oxfordshire has, has, has borne the risk and has, has ensured for the programme which has been brilliant for us. Thanks Alison and would you say that's the biggest challenge you've faced is that kind of finding the organising principle or um, is it the lack of funds or bikes or people who actually want to use the opportunity? No, none of that. I think it's I think it's getting the groups together. It's getting a system going, and and you saw that we've got that process. So you know, I'm sure we would be happy to adopt that. You know, for anybody to adopt that. I think it's just getting a group of people together who are prepared to to start it and get going and 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 manage risk. I think risk is a big thing, mm -hmm. but I think we have done that well through Active Oxfordshire. I I know I I imagine other other parts of the country do have the equivalent of active Oxfordshire because it's funded by Sport England. Uh, for me it's been a joy kind of meeting these new people within this group because uh, I hadn't made contact before and so I think one of the wonderful things about the project has been the partnership working. Brilliant and great to see in the chat um, people um, interested in links to share the information and then people in the chat even sh finding the links and sharing them themselves. Um, we should just mention that we're planning to um, collate all of the key um, bits of information from this and we will be circulating them to everyone who's attended afterwards. Can I just ask Tony, have you got your hand up with a question? I think Tony's muted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tony, you're on mute. So if you'd like to unmute yourself would, um, or pop your question in the chat, either way, we'd love to hear from you. Can we unmute? It's, what sort of connection are you having with the city council and the county council? Because there's also an interface with bike infrastructure and safe cycling on roads, and particularly the work that the two councils are doing. The... So the, the City Council is part of the steering group, is, is, is a partner in this, and we have our cycling champion from the City Council as part of the organising group. Um, the County Council hasn't been involved, but um, we keep them informed about what's going on because it is an Oxfordshire-wide project and, and, uh, and there are other elements of it in other parts of the county as well as in Oxford City itself. So we are engaged and... Um, and obviously, as a cycle campaign group and as Low Carbon Oxford North, we've been doing quite a lot on this emergency act of travel fund uh, to make sure that we are getting um, safe routes for people who are cycling as well as walking. 
so that uh, that the money's come through now i understand for oxfordshire and so there will be developments happening now to help people who are cycling that's great thank you alison and I, th I think there's so much interest in this at the moment that i think you know if you were able to produce a sort of template i could see that being replicated yeah. around well, the country i'll, I'll take that back to active oxfordshire and, yeah. and our next steering group to really get something written that's great. Thank you so much, Alison. So um, I'm just going to move on to a similar theme now. Um, I, I'm part of uh, um, Hook Norton Low Carbon, which is, and for those of you who don't know Oxfordshire, um, Hook Norton is a village in the north of, of the county. Um, and it's quite big and we have a, a fairly active um, low carbon group. And so I'm just going to ask Keith Musson. Keith, are you there? Oh yes, I can see you, yes. Um, and he, Keith is going to speak next because we've got an electric bike scheme going there and also a car club so that um, you can join Hook Norton Low Carbon and hire out an electric bike um, to get around in. And Keith is font of knowledge on electric bikes, cars and modes of transport. So I'm just going to ask Keith. I can see Keith there, but I'm not sure whether he can hear. Keith Musson from Hook Norton. I can hear you, Captain. Yes, thank you. I can, I can see can him, hear. but I'm not sure. Do we need to unmute? It seems to be unmuted. Can you um, hear me now? I don't know whether Keith is frozen. I can hear him. Can you? Oh, I can't hear Keith at I all. I can hear him. Oh, okay. Yes, we can hear him. We're in this okay. um, very unique. <laughs> Covid um, problem where me and my wife are both on Zoom calls. At the time. Um, so, um, I think it might be my computer actually. It's, I've got the colour wheel now. So. Would everyone mind putting a thumbs up if they can hear me, please? Okay, a few, not all. Okay. Oh, I can't find it. Well, thank you to those who are doing the thumbs up. Um, I guess I guess I'll just make a start if it is Catherine's um, machine, and then hopefully she will um, join back with us later. Um, by all means, whoever the organisers, just stop me if if you, if you want to pause for a second. Go for it, Keith. Thank you. Nah, okay. You. Great. So um, yeah, I I run the Hook Norton Low Carbon uh, e bikes. Scheme. And when I say I, it's a team. It's a team of us. There's about three of us to keep the bikes on the road and running. We've had the bikes since 2016, and we got the bikes through a government scheme called Compass Bikes. I don't know if any of you remember this scheme back in 2016. But essentially, um, e bikes were dumped <laughs> all over the country. And when I say all over the country, um, it was Ipswich, Cambridge. Uh, Felixstowe, somewhere else I can't remember, and the little village of Hook Norton, which, uh, you know, out of those places, Hook Norton is probably the hilliest by far, just from, if you've ever been to our village, you, you have to go down a hill or up a hill to get to it, that's, that's just the way it is. And when this scheme finished, and I was a user of this scheme, um, the bikes were sold to Hook Norton Low Carbon and so we took them on as uh, an initiative to um, to assist with the local community so basically to get people out using e-bikes. I should probably start by explaining that I'm a bike geek like I have 12 bikes in the garage ranging from silly little Bromptons to tandems to all sorts of uh, paraphernalia including a 1951 vintage bike I, even though I'm a big bike fan, I was a completely hooked on the e-bikes when they came to the village. They were a, a big uh, change. And I think um, a lot of the, the, the reason we wanted to share the e-bikes with the community was to really get people's mindset changed about what an e-bike is and what it does and what it, what it can bring um, to you. So I like to think of them as not necessarily bicycles, but maybe a softer alternative to using a car to get from A to B. You know, you don't necessarily want to get dressed up in lycra, you don't necessarily want to get all hot and sweaty, but you do want to move from A to B 
um, with a bit of light exercise and have some fun on the way. And the e-bikes are absolutely brilliant for that. And the usage we're, 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 we're getting out of them is, is showing that's the sort of feedback we get from the users of the bikes. So how it works? Well, we have um, six now. We've just upgraded our fleet. We have six bikes now, but we had four uh, originally. And we have a booking system. So as long as you're a member of the club, which uh, Catherine, I, I guess you don't mind me giving the prices out online, but it's, it's, it's um, I think it's a pound to join the low carbon club, which is ridiculous. It's five pounds to have access to the bikes for a year. And then it's two pounds to hire out a bike. So we're not doing this to make money. We are doing this to get people using the bikes so that they maybe go and buy their own or they continue using the bikes. It's really to encourage people to use them. And we've had several people, including my own mother, who have purchased their own e-bikes having used our, our, uh, our little cord of e-bikes. The bikes we've got, just to give a bit of feedback to you, if you were thinking about doing something uh, similar, the bikes you've got, we've got are good. You know, we started off with good bikes from the start. They were Bosch motored e-bikes. They probably retailed at 1700 quid when they were new, so they're not cheap. Um, but if you're gonna hire anything out, it's like, a, it's like if you hire out, you know, if you do an Airbnb or something like that, everything's gotta be solid because you've got people using them who are not used to using the bikes. So um, starting out with good quality stuff is, is always good. Don't leave them outside all year round like we did for the first two years because they really don't like it. And um, I was the one who had to deal with all the problems because although they're waterproof, um, electric and high temperature and low temperature is uh, not great. So we had a few issues with that. And then the third thing, which is sort of comes on to, leads on to the COVID thing is, is actually marketing them. Um, we really wanted to get people using them and, and actually we were only getting people using them maybe once a week um, initially. We made a decision to uh, develop our marketing uh, within the low carbon group. And that included social media, newsletters, basically reaching everyone we could. And around the same time, uh, unfortunately, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic sort of took hold and uh, lockdown occurred. And the usage of the bikes skyrocketed. Um, Quite, yeah, quite rapidly from maybe once or twice a week, which we were per perfectly happy with. Today's where all four bikes were being used all the time. We were having people, you know, struggling to get hold of a bike. Um, you know, if one broke, it was a real pain because we had to go and fix it quickly so that all these people could, could go and use them. So um, COVID-19, the nice weather, and uh, just people's perception of how to use bikes um, has definitely increased the usage of the bikes over this time. Uh, what else to add? I mean, just, just really the last few bits of, of the bikes in general. Um, I think we get, we've done open days with them and people come up to me and they say, well, I don't ride a new bike because I, I like bicycles and, and blah, blah, blah. And I explain to them that, well, you know, I ride bikes and I love the e-bikes. I think they're brilliant. Um, so there's a definite mindset that, that needs to be changed with, with, with e-bikes. Usually if you ask these people well, how often do they ride their bike, they say, well, actually, I haven't ridden it very often uh, recently because, um, you know, things are changing. Um, people don't, people are, someone mentioned infrastructure, people are generally a bit scared of riding on the road. And there's not a lot that, that I personally or, or, you know, one person can do about that. But what I would say is if you're riding a bike that's going to glide you up a hill at 15 mile an hour rather than, pushing hard at two mile an hour going up a hill, it feels a lot safer. And we've had that feedback from people that they feel safer on the e-bikes because they've got that little bit of extra push. I always say speed is your friend and I, I do believe that in a, in a way you're kind of moving with the traffic a bit better. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then I guess the last thing is, is uh, and you know, mainland Europe have got this um, so much sorted than we have, you know, the concept of a bike is very much a cheap thing that you have in the back of your uh, shed. And e-bikes are kind of questioning that a little bit. They are expensive, um, but then I, I always tell people to think about what they spent on their car 10 years ago as opposed to what they spent on their car now. 
Keith, Keith we have one quick question for you. Yeah, um, sure. do you. Are your bikes insured and how do you handle liability? Uh, they are insured. Um, <laughs> the liability is a good question. Um, and it's not one that I deal with. <laughs> okay, maybe that's something we can follow up on. Um, we've yeah, got sure. some good links in the chat. Um, and we'll, as I say, we'll be collecting all this information. There's some links to other campaigns. Um, and so we'll, we'll collate all of that and share it later. And perhaps we sure. can look into that liability question for people as well. Perfect. Oh, unmuted, unmute. Um, I think you're still muted. Kathy, you're okay. muted again. Unmute. Am I? Am I? Can you we hear? We can now hear you, Kathy. Yeah, oh. No, she's muted herself again. Um, maybe at this point, just to speed things on, and um, just to let you know that we were now going to hand over to Emma Arnold from West Mill Sustainable Energy Trust, who's been doing some great work with um, their education packs. Emma. Hi, thank you. Um, the idea from our perspective um, was to produce something for, well, initially, way back last winter, it was to produce something for schools predominantly, but also homeschoolers. Now, we're um, working with um, the wind farm and the solar park near Shrivenham, some of you might know it, um, and we wanted to get the idea um, of sustainable energy out there to children, particularly as the next generation, um, hopefully with a view in the long term to bringing in some young ambassadors um, and hoping they would get more involved with both wind and solar. So getting the word out to schools was really important um, and also I felt sort of maybe going a bit beyond that. Um, so when this struck um, and changed the way we all do things and suddenly children being schooled from home, it offered a bit of an opportunity and that was to appeal to parent teachers and guardian teachers as well as school teachers who are trained. Um, to that end the resource that we've sort of been working on has been one that hopefully appeals to um, everybody whether they're a trained teacher or not um, and whilst it's an academic resource we've sort of been trying to add to it with um, activity sheets and things that kids can get involved with. Um, so if I share my screen I can give you some examples of what we've been doing. Um, Okay, I'm not going to have to share yet. Excellent, fantastic. Um, so if I, um, let's have a look. Um, if I can just show you our landing page here. So this is at the moment where you come to when you go into the WESET website and look at our learning resources. Um, this is actually going to change slightly to make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, but what it demonstrates is the fact that we've got space for activity sheets, which are ever growing. So there's going to be more of those coming up very soon, um, as well as the various lessons within our, um, our lesson packs. So we've got um, at the moment six lessons, two of which are fully up. The remaining ones are coming up very soon. So they'll all be available to you. Um, and I just wanted to fairly swiftly run through what we're trying to provide to give you an idea of what's there. Uh, so with every lesson, as I said, the idea is they're accessible, um, differentiated, could be taught by somebody whether they're experienced or not. Um, every lesson comes with a lesson plan, which is a one sheet lesson plan. Regular teachers will be relatively used to this sort of thing um, with the key points for teaching a lesson. If you have less experience, they all come with a comprehensive delivery guide. The idea of that being understanding how to present from a presentation. Obviously, this is flexible. Some people like to use these, some people don't, but there's lots in there that enables you to personalize the teaching. Um, and then the guides are fully differentiated. So if you're asking questions, the sort of level that you're asking of, this is predominantly aimed at key stage two, early key stage three students. Um, but again, you know, there's an amount of flexibility and we have things like video links, which are also embedded in the presentations. So hopefully it's a fairly comprehensive um, guide to how to deliver it. Uh, for each of the lessons, we also have worksheets. Um, and hopefully parents will be reassured to know that all of the worksheets have worksheets with full answers in as well. Um, so there shouldn't be any sort of problems, you know, coming back with that. Um, and the understanding as well is all there for you if I just flip that up. 
um, quickly when she would answer. So you get a feel for that. Um, and they're all very varied. Uh, hopefully um, they're engaging and fun. Um, if we go to a presentation, they're also fairly interactive. So I won't um, run it as a slideshow. Excuse me, sorry, we're both working in an office. I apologize for that. Um, so as you go through the slideshows, there's also um, guides at the bottom of the slideshow, which you can bring up. And then um, when we get to uh, tasks or activities, these link in with the worksheets and they're interactive. So when you're presenting, you can give answers for each of those. Um, my background is in design and technology and teaching, and I'm always really keen that there are sort of physical activities as well as you know on screen activities um, so lots of these tie into tasks and activities that children can do at home or at school and another thing about that is I've tried to design them all to be um, used you know relatively low cost or highly accessible materials predominantly recycled materials um, that are available to them um, and they include things like linked videos um, and there's quite a lot of sort of uh, what we in teaching call formative assessment opportunities, but there are lots of opportunities for sort of revision and recall and things like that. Um, and we've also got these activity sheets. Uh, the idea with these was in response to the COVID crisis was to try and offer something that was uh, more user friendly at home possibly, and that children could do with parents or guardians or even older siblings. Um, and each sheet, this is the second one, which is about biodiversity. The first one looks at renewable energies um, and each of them has a range of activities, cross-curricular activities hopefully. It also has links to useful websites um, and you know a fit, some sort of physical hands-on activity at the end of it which children can get involved with and the idea is to link them all to each other. So this one the idea was reusing if they printed off the sheets from the first activity to reuse them to make these little seed pots um, and just very quickly this is the third one which is about six hours and again at the end of it we've got um make you a little you know little windmill um pinwheel i think they call them um out of recycled cereal box um but it also the idea is to try and engage children with concepts like the circular economy things that they might not know about already and hopefully as well um engage parents too um so this has been a big part of what we've been doing and then I'm just aware of the time, so very briefly, um, we've also been um, uh, exploring how we can get sort of our message across without bringing people into the site. And so to that end, we've created a virtual visit, so a virtual tour, which you can look at, it's about 12 minutes long, and you can go to online, I'll put a link to that. Um, and I'm in the process of adapting that so that it can be delivered by our really experienced guides in a webinar form. So you can actually have a personal guided tour um, with us, albeit not in the beautiful green landscape that we have to offer. Um, and really, we want to just get this out there. These are free resources and uh, it would be great if they go further afield. You know, it's brilliant to be local, but the people are welcome to use them wherever and, you know, and share theirs as well. So some really positive feedback already in the chat channel and requests from Chris and Cecilia from WESET to also ask people to share them and to also let you have any feedback. Um, but yeah, we've certainly been sharing them amongst um, around Oxfordshire and getting some really good response. So we will be, um, yeah, please, please share. And we will be sharing details of all of these um, resources in a follow up to this session. Thanks, uh, Emma. They look absolutely brilliant, those. And, um, and it would be fantastic if people are able to log on to the virtual tour and then use the education resources afterwards. I mean, they're just wonderful. So um, it's great. Yeah, the more sharing, the better. I mean, um, they, they could be used, I think, around the country as well. I mean, that's just a fantastic resource. So thanks very much indeed, Emma, for that. And um, I'm going to uh, move on to our, our next um, group who are going to share their initiatives, which is Low Carbon Oxford North. And uh, we're going to hear from Rebecca Nestor. Low Carbon Oxford North always have lots of stuff going on um, around the year, but they, they really, during, during 
the COVID crisis, I think they've really come up with some fantastic ideas. And so I'm going to ask Rebecca to open up with those. Thank you very much, Cathy. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I want to tell you about three things that uh, we have done. Um, they, they, the, the, the first one was very early on during lockdown, and it actually seems a long time ago now. And I think that um, it may not initially feel like a particularly innovative approach, but um, if I can, am I, am I able to share my screen? It looks as if I can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm just going to share my screen to show you um, a description of what we call a climate cafe. Now, um, the what we mean by a climate cafe is um, it, it's, it's not necessarily a cafe in the traditional sense, but it does share those features of um, hospitality, of people coming together to share food and drink. Um, and what it also is about is is trying to avoid the usual feeling of an environmentalist's gathering where there's always a task. There's always some kind of expectation of things that you need to do as a result of coming to the meeting and that perhaps you will be sucked into joining a group and, um, and you know, becoming one of them. They, our climate cafes are aimed at people who might be, might, who are worried and concerned about climate change, but who um, perhaps are, are feeling the lack of an opportunity to discuss it, bec perhaps because they feel that if they do go and talk to people about climate change, they will be somehow kind of classified um, with an environmentalist identity, or they will be criticised for not doing enough, or perhaps even that they are themselves a very long-standing environmentalist and they're so angry about what is not being done that it's actually hard to have the conversation. Um, and so I'm just going to scroll down to the description of the climate cafes that we run. Um, they're facilitated um, and they are, they are actually about excluding the idea of, of, of action from this particular space. It's not that action is not important, of course it's crucial, but our psychological take on it is that um, talking about climate change is a way of freeing up people's capacity to think and act um, and that if people are not able to talk by because of feelings of guilt or frustration, then their action is less easy to access, their, their, their capacity to act is less easy to access. So we provide this space in which we just talk about climate change and our re responses to it, thoughts and feelings about it. Uh, and we share, you know, hot drinks and, and cake. Now, now, clearly we were not able to do the hot drinks and cake during lockdown, but we did move very, very quickly um, from the, the physical cafe to um, an online version on Zoom and what we and we moved from a monthly gathering to a weekly gathering because we if you remember in the early stages of lockdown there was a lot of that there was a lot of let's come together on Zoom and just talk about how we're, how it's affecting us and we found that the opportunity to talk about climate change and its relationship to lockdown and to Covid and the pandemic and the links between uh, the behaviour that's caused climate change and the behaviour that's, that's caused the pandemic was would seem to be very valuable for people. We also found that we had people not just from our part of Oxford um, joining and that was that was really that was really quite powerful. What we have found since is that the weekly gathering is not needed um, and that it, we're really feeling now that the, the, the Zoom place for it is we really want to go back to the face to face. So we're kind of hoping that we will be able to move back to a physical location, but um, that as a as a quick move to give people a chance to come together, it was um, it was helpful. So that's the first thing um, I wanted to mention. The um, the second thing um, is uh, uh, a workshop on um, climate conversations. Essentially, how do we have those conversations with our friends and family? How do we manage to to um, uh, to share our feelings but also to kind of get across to people how important it is and we were doing those um, uh, I've been doing those uh, face to face for a long time and we introduced them for um, low carbon Oxford North members and supporters um, during the lockdown on Zoom and um, uh, as with the Climate Cafe we were quite surprised at how um, how helpful the Zoom format was, that people were able to share thoughts and feelings in a way that perhaps doesn't happen quite so much face to face. Um, so they were in a way more intimate. 
Again, I'm going to be glad to go back to face-to-face -to -face for these, but I think the, the Zoom platform was more valuable than we thought it might be. Um, and then the third thing I want to share with you is an event that's just coming up tomorrow, um, which is about sustainable fashion. Um, I, don't, I hope you can see that well enough. Uh, this is the Eventbrite link and I'll also paste the link in the chat. Um, as the shops open, um, we thought, okay, it's really time to introduce people to, to a discussion about um, the environmental impacts of uh, the shopping that we do and with a particular focus on, on clothing. Um, and we're lucky that um, one of our members who is a sustainability educator has uh, got very good links with sustainability professionals and she has invited Stephen Corley who was head of sustainability at John Lewis to come along um, and give us this talk. We've got well over 100 people signed up for it but because it's a webinar we can take more so if any people here want to come you're more than welcome and I'll post the, the Eventbrite link in the chat as I say. Um, one of the things that we're that we're finding is that as we there's been a lot of publicity about this event and we're finding that there's a lot of discussion not just about the 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 production and purchase and disposal of clothes but the the shopping processes that underpin the acquisition of clothes so a lot of people talking about mm, what about all the car parking around the john lewis store in um our city center um and how can we how can we as well as reducing shopping um, and reducing the purchase of new clothes, how can we manage the processes of actually doing the shopping? So it's 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 opened up things that we perhaps didn't expect, and I think it's it's going to be um, it's going to be great. So uh, that's all from me. Um, I will just if I've still got this in the paste. Yes, I have. There you go. There's the link to the event. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, no yeah. specific questions for you, but um, just brilliant to hear how, um, as we're dealing with the challenges of COVID, that's actually giving you opportunities to view things through different angles and create those kind of moments of opportunity to go in and, um, you know, as you say, pick up on fashion or think about, get people to rethink about transport. So back to Cathy. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, you know, thanks so much, Rebecca. That's that's brilliant. I'm signed up for the um, fashion sustainability um, webinar tomorrow. So, um, and I think it sounds wonderful. And I really like the way that makes the link with globalization as well, and how and how you made the link earlier on between the causes of climate change being very similar to the causes of of the pandemic and what one is fueling the other. And I just wanted to ask you. Um, was it you, Rebecca, that came up with the post-capitalist reading list on on the uh, Alcon website? Um, we, we, we did. I'm not sure about a post-capitalist reading list. We came up with um, our coordinator, Julia Patrick, um, in the first weeks after lockdown. Um, uh, suggested that we might we might focus our first newsletter um, during that period on. Um, just what the resources were that were available locally for people around COVID. And so we, in a sense, we kind of took a little bit of a step back from our, fo our normal focus on climate change. And we saw ourselves more as a community group trying to help people cope with, with, the, with this kind of unprecedented uh, experience. Um, and so I'm not sure about post-capitalists, but there was certainly oh, okay. a long list of resources that we, were, that we circulated. Oh, I thought I saw that on the web site and I was interested to know what they might be because um, you know I think it's a very good time to talk about alternatives to capitalism at the moment um, but anyway so that's a fantastic set of, of stuff that's being done in, in North Oxford there and um, but the webinar would be open to everyone around the country so that would be great if more people could um, link onto that and I, I'm really looking forward to it and, and we'll feed back on it so thank you and so we're just going to move on to our last speaker. We're slightly behind time. And that's Paul Skinner from Rose Hill and Ifley Low Carbon um, in Oxford as well. And that's, that's another very active and lively group who always have lots of stuff going on. But they've thought of some fantastic initiatives to use during the coronavirus period. So Paul, contact, oh, there you are, yes. So um, if you'd like to start. Hi, thank you for that. Um, yes, an impressive range of things, hard acts to follow, really. Um, Rosalind Ifilokardi is, is a small um, group 
working within Rose Hill and Ifley, which those of you who don't know Oxford is a quite a mixed area, but with a large area of quite deprived um, housing stock. Um, and one of the things that we're keen on doing is sort of trying to maintain our links with the local community or and develop them in this time when we're um, not out and about so much. So, and where we're not able to do things like have stalls at local events or run our repair cafes, which has been a really good way of involving people who we wouldn't otherwise engage in the conversation, perhaps. Um, so we've organised a few things which we can do at social distance. Uh, sorry, at physical distance, but hopefully um, increasing the social links. So we did, for example, a seedling share. We normally do a repair cafe every other month. Um, and last summer we we did um, share some seedlings at one of them and we thought we would use that idea. And in, and we've had, over the area, we had the day that we did it, we had 11 tables outside, 11 houses with um, a range of seedlings and plants that we were basically giving to people who wanted them or able to swap if they were bringing them as well. And about 600 seedlings were shared at some point during the, the morning and um, we reckon that there were each stall had up to 20 different people coming either just to take things away or to, to swap things and um, we made quite a few new contacts for the group during this and the remaining seeds and seedlings were given to the primary school for their gardening club. We work quite clo closely with the, with the primary school, so we were able to donate bits and pieces to those. Um, the second thing that we did after, since lockdown is um, continue to water our trees. We, we had a big tree planting campaign in the autumn. Um, of course, not, not envisaging either the lockdown or the um, lack of rainfall this spring. So we were getting very worried about the trees, but we did manage to organise a physically distance, distanced watering event. We have somebody living fairly near there, near the recreation ground where they were all planted with a hose pipe. So he was continually um, filling watering cans and buckets for people. And then another neighbour across the road realised what was going on and he um, joined in. So we, had, we then had two, um, sources of water which meant we didn't have to wait so long for the for our um, cans to be um, filled up and we had about 30 people involved in that lots of whom who we had lots of whom hadn't really been very much involved with our group before so another good um, contact. Um, another thing we did which was quite different is that I happened to been doing a course at Oxford continuing education on environmental ethics and climate change. Um, I didn't get the didn't get to the last two lectures because they were um, closed down at that point but the group were interested in what I'd been learning about and so we made one of our monthly meetings into a kind of Zoom seminar where I was able to talk about some of the issues that we discussed and were um, talked about on on the course and um, we were able to have a bit of a sort of more reflective time as you know, the, the core members particularly but we did have a few extra people come along to that Zoom event um, and sort of reflect a little bit on um, things that we perhaps don't always think about. We, 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 we get on with trying to, to do things but we don't always um, have a chance to reflect and think about some of the more um, interesting ethical um, things that are, are driving our work. So that was a, a good opportunity as well. Um, and very briefly, as I know we're running out of time, um, there's a small nature reserve on the Rose Hill, on the corner of the Rose Hill estate, which um, some of us help maintain in conjunction with Wild Oxford um, and the Wildlife Trust. Um, and there's been a bit of contro controversy because the university have fenced off their bit of the um the reserve but we are hope we are working with the university and we actually hope to be able to run um have a path which runs not only th back through their part of reserve but back down to the river beyond ifley church 
which would mean that people can go in one end and come out the other end and make, it will make a, circu a potential circular route for people rather than it basically being sort of leading, not leading anywhere else at the moment. And we think that would vastly increase the, the um, ability of the local community to, to sort of access and, and enjoy the, the reserve. Um, we were, we're, doing, we're still working with Cyclops and other people to help look at the um, cycling issues around the area, but um, that's the key things that we've been doing, I suppose, since we locked down. Oh, that's really brilliant, Paul. Thank you so much indeed. And um, I think I think that that brings to the end um, our speakers from who, who are going to talk today about about their work in their communities in Oxford, Oxfordshire. And so, I mean, as we've all just seen, there's a fantastic um, breadth of, of things that people are doing that are really inspirational, but also mostly replicable as well. So I think that's really important. And um, so now, I mean, it's a sort of um, pivotal moment, I think, uh, um, where we are now and I don't think those come along that often um, where there is you know something's happened that's stopped people and our system in its tracks and there is an opportunity we don't know how big it's going to be but um, to actually change things a little and work out where we'd like those changes to be and, and use kind of what, what we've learned through this period I think everyone's learned a lot about themselves about um, the groups that they're in and, and how, how we live our lives really. So on that note, we're just going to break out, invite everyone to um, divide into breakout rooms and we're going to just have some smaller discussions. And I'll just remind um, each group to appoint somebody who's going to actually feed back. So we'll, we'll break out for about 15 minutes, um, get a really good discussion going, see where it goes. And, and the question that we're sort of um, overarching that with is how can we use what we've learned in lockdown to change the future for the better and keep the climate change go message going at the same time so um, we'll meet back in 15 minutes with any ideas and thoughts that we've come up with so i, th I think we were group number one actually weren't we um, yes. All right, so so we elected Phil, Phil Coventry, um, to, to be our spokesperson, and you're going to feed back. I can't see you anywhere, Phil, but I'm sure you're there. Oh, he's not at his Phil, um, oh, Phil. screen at the moment. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Could we start with another group? Um, okay, yes. What about Break group? out two, Saski, that was yours. Yes, Cecilia is going to be our spokesperson. Fantastic. Oh, you're on mute there, Cecilia. Got you. Okay, sorry, I hadn't checked that again. Um, okay, so um, Sarah was saying that uh, she thought funding was one of the biggest issues for um, getting us back on track. Um, and she was talking about uh, some meet meetings she'd been to uh, about the carbon offset fund. Um, we thought perhaps it was a London mayor's fund, but um, possibly all local authorities have access to it. Um, this was the, the Community Energy England conference she'd been to. Um, we secondly thought that virtual meetings were an asset um, they've attracted people from much wider areas um, so we get not just local people um, there are local people as well who have difficulty with traveling who are able to access the meeting so that's facilitated it um, but obviously um, obviously you don't get that body language and perhaps it's not so easy for smooth conversation and interchange because you just have to pause especially if there are lots of people there um, small special interest groups can meet very easily and quickly doing this um, and show their work. Presentations are very quickly shown. Um, um, and generally we thought we, you, people use the car less and manage without using the car. Also the difference um, coming back to uh, starting off new, um, the lady in Hazelmere, sorry I forgot your name, was saying that she was um, starting off this uh, new hub and it was difficulty without having subsidies, so there's no feed-in tariff. So, and Saskia mentioned the fact that, of course, now the, the spot price of electricity has been so distorted. So projects that thought they might have been viable in January are looking a bit different now because of the lack of the, the electricity um, prices have been changed so much. Um, so th they're not always financially feasible looking through the lens at the moment. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's about it. 
Okay, so thank you very much, Celia. So I think we've got all of those points done and we're going to share our, our feedback um, later. So we're going to go back to group number one. Uh, so Philip from Community Energy England, you were going to feedback from our, our discussion group. Hello everyone. Yes, um, let me see what we, were, what we said. Um, so we, we talked about the way that um, there's been quite a lot more community awareness, connection, activity um, in the last few months. Um, and it was mentioned that there was a, a fair bit of positivity um, within that kind of a level. Um, and one of the big things we kind of talked about was finding the connection between the events that are happening now because it's not just the pandemic then there's Black Lives Matter which has then kind of bubbled up into the news um, and the messaging and how to kind of engage people with sustainability and climate change issues um, is whilst not something that people have been worried about doing um, and they've been happy to keep kind of uh, raising that messaging and, and get people engaged. Um, it's a little bit more about how to keep it relevant and how to keep it seen and heard um, when there's a lot else going on as opposed to kind of when would be the right time to start trying to re-engage people in this environmental stuff. Um, and then with connecting to that, the thread that maybe runs through maybe all of the big things that are going on at the moment is the equity side, is the sense that um, there are a lot of people within our society who have been left behind or marginalised or underprivileged and those are being exposed really a lot at the moment very visibly and so the way to um, keep the environmental stuff relevant and, and connect it back to um, what people have been experiencing and seeing is, is about that equity side and um, somebody talked about um, uh, leave no one behind and which is trying to really kind of connect with all of the different people in their community and on an even a street by street house by house kind of a basis so i think that that really connects to broader recognition somebody mentioned build back better and it's like how do you connect that really low level and making sure that people are seen and connected to each other with the national and then international level i think so um, yeah quite a productive chat okay thanks thanks very much phil um, so I'm just moving aware of time, so I'm going to move fairly swiftly on to uh, group number three. That was Tabitha's group. Tabitha. It was indeed, and I have been nominated to feed that. <laughs> 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 so we talked about two kind of main things. We have people from different areas, different backgrounds, um, which is really interesting. So yeah, the two kind of key things we covered were the cycling question, which is there's been lots of new interest and lots of initiatives, some of which we've seen today in getting people into active travel. Um, but how do we now ensure that those new people who maybe haven't cycled before um, are safe with traffic coming back? Um, and equally, how do we make our cities better accommodated to cycling and active travel with more pedestrian areas? Um, and particularly building on that kind of air pollution question, which has been one of the really positive things. Um, so how do we keep that going? Um, engaging with councils is one way, but there's also the kind of some councillors have limited funds. Um, so the importance of how it, having councillors who understand the problem um, and any ideas on that welcome. There's also like a bit of frustration from people who've maybe been working on this for a while um, and wanting more space for cyclists. And I guess that's broadly with climate change as well. Um, but the general feeling was it's kind of a positive opportunity um, and ways to keep the positive momentum going. And then the other thing we talked about, which has been covered as well, is the benefit of these kind of online meetings. So finding them really productive and less time wasted and being able to reach more people as we've seen today, which is brilliant. Um, so yeah, keeping those going, but also the the idea that there'll probably be a mix. So the disadvantage was seen as there being no kind of water cooler type breakout conversations and that kind of idea generation naturally that you might not get in an online space. So probably there'll be a mix, but definitely keen to carry on these kind of online sessions. Mm. Oh, that's great. Thanks very much, Tabitha. So you, you cover quite a lot in your group. I think that's good. Um, so I'm not sure how many groups there were, but group number four. Okay. That was uh, okay, Alison and Rakesh, yeah, that group. Yep, so I was nominated to feedback for our group. Uh, so we spent half the time actually just introducing ourselves because it's again a really fascinating group of, of people coming together. So um, by the time we got talking, 
the things that really the most important thing that came up was about localization. So the more things we start doing locally, uh, most of the issues start to get resolved. So, for example, uh, the more uh, we start working locally, the more we start uh, utilizing different people's skills, local skills, skill sharing and things, the more we start helping each other in all kinds of aspects, the less we're reliant on resources and things from outside. The more we start growing food that is locally, whether that's skilling each other to grow in our own homes or in community projects, which is my area, uh, the, the less we then have to rely, for example, on transportation. So we can massively cut back on transportation needs, etc. And uh, yeah, so to start looking at how we move forward using more uh, skill shares, more utilizing local skills and, um, um, you know, informal economies rather than the formal cash economy um, and also when it comes to when we were talking about food uh, going more towards a different you know that the current methods of growing food are quite clearly unsustainable let alone uh, regenerative so looking at how we change our food habits and our food needs and instead of uh, expecting foods all year round of a particular type is to maybe look at more nutritionally dense foods where you don't need to need, eat anywhere near as much because it's nutritionally so dense. And again, that's that's kind of my mm. area that I enjoy talking about. So yeah, so localization seems to be a, a significant answer to most of the issues. That's oh, well, thank you, thank you very much, Rakesh. That that was great, and I think that's a really important point about localization and uh, and whether we'll be able to keep that going. Uh, and I hope we will. Um, was there a group number five? Group five disbanded, so we've moved okay. straight on to group six. <laughs> six, right, okay. <laughs> All right, then group six. Was there a, um, a person who can feedback from group number six? Did you even know you were in group number six? Um, I'm happy to feedback. We didn't nominate because we were busy okay. talking. Yeah, okay. Um, we, we actually sort of moved on from the, the idea of education we're talking about um youth and young people and how you get the message out there as a result of this and continue to do so and saying that it's actually really quite difficult to get into schools you know you can get into assemblies but uh, somebody pointed pointed out that actually assembly is sometimes an area where when, when you can't fit it in elsewhere in the curriculum where you're sort of put and actually how do you um rather than just make it an academic thing how do you embed it in the way schools and then more widely youth groups um you know churches scouts brownies all of those different sort of areas how how they work um and somebody was talking about a sort of sustainability audit as it were and getting them to engage with it by looking at how sustainable they are as an organization or a group um but yeah just really trying to get the word out and, and make it something that is more about the way they act and the way they live day to day than just something they do at school you know another subject that was the sort of key thing, really. Oh, yeah, I think that that's a, a really, really good point um, about the schools and assemblies. It, it's hard to um, get beyond that. Um, I used to, before I did this, I used to, um, um, at one point, I was an artist in schools, um, in primary schools, and um, I used to uh, get everybody to, all the parents and children, to collect all their plastic goods at home, all different colours. They would bring them in, we'd have a massive, massive mountain of it, and then we would, as a sort of art activity over a few weeks, we would make totem poles <laughs> out of all the stuff. And that was, uh, that really engaged the kids, and that was a, a great way of them sort of starting to think about recycling and waste and stuff, you know, without it being on a whiteboard and, and stuff like that so I think Terry yeah. had her hand up yes Terry. Uh, we didn't talk about this in our group but um, we, our climate action group had has a member who's young who's at secondary school and he and his teachers and our group got together and we had a eco fair and mm -hmm. that was a it was at the weekend but held at the school and the kids all knew about it. It was in the newsletters and kids were taking part in various stalls about eco issues, if you like. And they had videos and they also had people come in like from, from the 
um, energy sector and stuff like that. So that was a good event and, and a good way of involving kids. That's great, thank you. And um, we're actually going to ask you to come talk about that at one of our next um, local webinars about community engagement and how to um, involve young people if we can. So um, thank you. Um, was there, uh, that's that, is that the total amount of groups, Zoe? Or was there a group seven? So we no, heard that's that from everybody there. So thank you. And um, that's a really, really good comprehensive range of issues and, and questions there. Um, are there um, are there any other contributions from groups not from Oxfordshire that you just like to make at the moment? Any 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 points or things that are in your area that um, that you'd like to discuss? Just briefly. Could I make a plug for Chester? Yes. Go right here. Yes. Um, they've just run is following on the last one. They've just run a surprisingly successful virtual eco-fair online with a whole program of half hour, one hour sessions over about a two or three day period. And they got a really good pickup and said, compared to organizing the, the original planned eco-fair in the church hall or whatever, or the town hall, yeah. Yeah. it was awful lot easier. And <laughs> a lot of the groups were small, but you got the people who really wanted to be in them. Just a thought. Yes, well, that, that's a really good idea. Um, anyone else who's got anything else from around the country? Um, I was just going to mention very briefly that um, when Phil was doing our summing up, um, that the Leave No One Behind uh, campaign came from um, Transition Lim, which is that in Lancashire or Cheshire, Julia? Is it in Cheshire. In Cheshire, so it's near Warrington, and that 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 sounded like a great scheme that they had a, cha a street champion in every street, and so that everyone became aware of who was elderly in their road, people that they didn't really know, who were living next door to them, what their needs were, and and how to how to look out for each other, and that's going to continue on. So that's that's been a um, a really great thing that's that that's come out of this. May I do a quick plug for? May I do a quick plug for Community Energy England? Yes, go on. <laughs> um, so it was mentioned at the beginning that it's Community Energy Fortnight that started on Saturday. So um, if you go on our website, um, I'll can put the link in again. Um, but if you go into events, there's Community Energy Fortnight. So there's quite a lot of different, um, everything's online, which is quite nice to see. You can go to everything. So um, there's quite a lot of events that are on the page there. Uh, some of which um, hopefully you'll find interesting. Um, and we have, uh, our annual conference this year so I think it was just mentioned before that we've been having some online events so um, there was one just last Friday we have a, a second part of it is on the 29th of June and um, so that's an online conference which is free to access and will be in the afternoon with various speakers um, and kind of is going to pull out some of the themes that are coming out of the fortnight so it will will pick up on some of the things that um, we've been talking about today I'm sure so um, yeah in encourage you to to uh, come along there if you have an interest in the energy side of this community stuff that we've all been talking about thank you that's brilliant brilliant thank you and so I, I, I was just going to ask um, before we close um, how we can all keep in touch with each other from around the country. I mean, in Oxfordshire, you know, we, we have people keep in touch with us through the Low Carbon Hub. We have a, a community's uh, newsletter um, and that and that will ha that has most of the events that people are talking about in it. So, so you can see that. But I was wondering how, how we could, you know, keep in touch. I was going to, unprompted by Philip, um, make sure everyone's aware of the Community Energy Lumio site which is a great place where, um, if particularly on the community energy side, um, where practitioners can go and pose questions, um, share information about some highly technical aspects of community um, energy, which I've certainly learned a lot just following some of the threads. And that's, I think if you just go to the Community Energy um, England website, is that right, Phil? That's the best way to go and, and sign up. Yeah, I'll post a link in here. Um... It's, you have to just request access because it's um, restricted to 
um, members of Community Energy England and only community level ones. So um, the kind of we've got some members like the the distribution networks and they're not allowed in, so it's it's uh, restricted. So you just got to join Community Energy England, which is free if you're a small group, and then you can sign up to the, the okay. uh, yeah the area. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Chris, did you want to? Yeah. Well, I mean, a few years ago we had the Low Carbon Communities Network, which did a lot of this. One of the problems for that was that a lot, of, about 25% of the groups involved were community energy groups. And the need for something different turned into Community Energy England. And that took most of the best resourced groups. So Low Carbon Communities Network kind of went into decline. Um, and, but I think there is still, as you say, a need for some way to share the kind of good practice that's been talked about today. Um, the session tomorrow, blatant plug, by a new organisation called Carbon Copy. They've set themselves up specifically so that good practice can be shared and copied around the country. But um, something a bit more kind of community-led would be highly desirable. Um, yeah, I think it's nice that we can see each other as well. Hmm. Uh, for me. <laughs> um, well, I'm, ju I'm just going to mention, uh, because um, we have a couple more webinars coming up as part of Community Energy Fortnight um, that are national. And Tuesday the 23rd at 6pm, we have Scott Wheeler, who's going to be talking about smart grid trials as part of Project Leo here in Oxford, um, local energy Oxfordshire, that is. And then Thursday the 26th um, at 6 p.m. again, we have Tom Heal, um, who's going to be talking about the need for ground, ground mount solar in Oxfordshire. So um, those will both be well worth going to. And uh, on our local ones, we have um, one on Thursday morning, the 25th at 11 a.m., and which we're going to talk about um, community engagement and how to involve young people and any hard to reach groups in, in the um, energy efficiency sort of area. So um, I think that I was just going to thank everybody for coming today. I've really enjoyed it. And I think it's been absolutely wonderful and inspiring hearing from groups around the country. And we had some really thoughtful um, talks in our discussion groups. And, um, and I, I hope that we have another one <laughs> before too long. So um, I think we're probably, that's 12.28. So that's probably the end of, of today's discussion. Unless anyone- Do you have one question from John? Was it a quick question we can help with? Yeah, I just wondered if this could be, re be repeated in say a month's time. It's so interesting. We'll certainly look into that and also figure out what the best um, sort of organisation to host it might be. But yeah, we'll certainly follow that up as an action. Um, would just give us a nod if anyone else would find it helpful kind of a, at a national level. Any thumbs up or nods? Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that brings to a, a close our meeting for today, really. And um, Tabitha, I just wondered if you'd just like to um, sum up how we'll share some of the links and, 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 and where people will be able to find the recording and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, sure. So we have all of your emails from registering. Um, so we'll drop you an email uh, later today or tomorrow with a kind of summary document of what's been discussed today and some of the links um, and we'll put the recording up on our YouTube channel so I'll link to that as well um, so you can share with anyone it will just be the, the start and the end it won't be the breakout rooms bit um, but yeah we'll send you an email and that will have details on how else we could keep in touch as well okay well um, thank you very much I, I've really been inspired by this um, so thank you and I think that brings the meeting to a close. So thank you, everybody. And until thank we all you all for coming. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.